Hi, I'm Claire, and as you saw from the thumbnail of this video, this is an incredibly massive book haul. I've been buying books. <laughs> I also didn't do a book haul for month and month and month. We are going to start straight away diving because there's so many things to get through. So first up, let's talk about books that were sent to me by publishers. We've got The City We Became by N.K. Jemison, which was sent to me by Orbit UK like way before lockdown. <laughs> so this is how long I've not done a book haul for. Definitely time for a catch up. This is N.K. Jemisin's first contemporary fantasy. We are in a world where cities become alive, they become embodied in people that like represent the city, they are the avatar of the city and they can defend it against baddies. New York is in the process of becoming embodied into five different avatars representing each of its boroughs in this book and the baddie is this like evil malevolent alien force that takes the shape of a woman dressed in white and then like takes over some people to do its bidding and um, I've already read this obviously <laughs> I'm going to be reviewing it shortly also need to catch up on my reviews, shockingly. After that, I had a fairly long time of not receiving any ARCs from publishers because they weren't sending physical books out because, you know, pandemic. But now books have started coming in again. So I've got three more that I've received from publishers. First up, we have The Relentless Moon by Mary Robinette Kowal. This is the third book in her Lady Astronaut series. Although this is about a new character, the first two books are about Alma York, who is the titular Lady Astronaut. But this book is about Alma's friend Nicole, who is the wife of a senator and also herself a lady pilot and then astronaut. And in this book, I believe Alma is on Mars and Nicole is on the moon, working on the new moon colony and having to do not only science, but also quite a lot of politicking to get the colony on the moon working out well. And then her husband, the senator, tells her that he wants to run for president. And I suspect she will not be very happy with that. This one is a chunker. I've listened to the first two on audio, so I don't actually know if they were this big, uh, but I am looking forward to this. I really liked Nicole as a character in the first couple of books. So let's see what she gets up to in this one. Next up, I've got The Trials of Coley by M.R. Carey. And this one was sent to me by Orbit UK. It is the second book in the Rampart trilogy. The first one was The Book of Coley, which they also sent me. And this arrived at the very beginning of pandemic things hitting the fan. So I did not read it immediately because... Um, <laughs> Tis a post-apocalyptic book. <laughs> and I was not in the mood, uh, but I do love M.R. Carey's writing. He wrote The Girl with All the Gifts, which is one of my favorite books. So I'm looking forward to getting into this series at some point. The whole premise is that the world, the plants, the animals were dying. And so because the environment was dying, humans decided to meddle and make the plants and the animals stronger. And now they've taken over and they want to kill us. We are following this boy, Coley, who lives in this world where, you know, the plants and the animals are out to get you, which, you know, maybe you can get the point of view of the plants and the animals. I'm just saying maybe I can see where they're coming from. <laughs> it's going to be cool when I do actually get to it, but... I think it might be a little much even for now. Also worth pointing out, this one came out in April. This one is coming out in September. The third book in the series will also come out relatively soon. I don't know the exact date, but this is a series that was all already written and they wanted to have it out fast. That was part of the point in publishing it the way they did. Like one book in April and one book in September is really, really close together in terms of publishing a trilogy, but that is kind of part of the point, I guess. So the third book should be out really, really soon. If you pick these up and you like them, then the third book should be like forthcoming imminently. 
And finally, I've got Savage Legion by Matt Wallace. This was sent to me by Saga Press. It is the first book in a new epic fantasy trilogy that Matt has written. Matt is a friend of mine, so I'm really, really excited to actually get to this one. The trilogy is called the Savage Rebellion Trilogy. I do enjoy a good revolution and or rebellion, so this is very, very exciting. It's got blurbs by Sarah Gailey and Kate Elliott as well, and it is about this portion of the army, this legion made up of of people that they call savages and they are people who have been taken from the street basically the slums poor populations and forced into service in the savage legion where they have to commit quite a bit of violence and be subjected also to quite a bit of violence our main character is called evie and she is not herself a savage she is a warrior with a mission of revenge to look for the man that she once loved but in order to find him she is going to have to infiltrate the savage legion become a savage herself aside from the fact that i want to read this because it sounds awesome and because matt is my friend another friend of mine didi hano recently read this and talked about it on twitter said it was really really great and talked about it having um some things to say in conversation with the very famous ursula Le Guin piece those who walk away from omelas that is a very very interesting thing for someone to say first of all any Le Guin like comparison or mention is something that's going to make me very interested in a book but also like that particular story is about what we as a society choose to sacrifice for the good of a society versus like the good of individuals just a very intriguing point of reference that Didi brought up and now I'm very very intrigued to read this and I have put it on my TBR for August, so we will see. Next up, I've got a whole bunch of books that I got in Illumi Crates, and I have not read any of these yet, so I don't know much about them, but I do know that I was very excited for this one, Havenfall by Sarah Holland, because this was a book I already had on my most anticipated list for, I think, the first or second quarter of the year. So this is a book about the Havenfall Inn, I believe, which is at the top of this here mountain on the cover, and it sits at the boundary between the magical and mundane world, and it is a place of peace and transition. It's a place where there's for a very, very long time been a truce when you are at the inn and in between the worlds. It's accepted that you're not going to cause trouble, but then one day someone gets murdered and our main character who inherited the inn from her family has to kind of deal with the fact that there's now an investigation going on in her establishment. One of the people conducting the investigation from the fairy side is someone that potentially there is something going on with romantically speaking, so that's quite interesting. Next up we have The Midnight Lie by Marie Rudkowski. This one is a secondary world fantasy that is set in a world in a city that is very harshly divided along class lines. So we have the High Kith who are able to have all of the nice things. They can have sweets and wear colors and basically do whatever they want. And then you've got regular people like our protagonist Nerim who are not allowed to do any of those things. Also on top of this really harsh life that she lives she definitely has magic that's not allowed and that she needs to keep very very secret but then one day a rakish traveler shows up with rumors that maybe the high kith to have magic and of course she has to decide whether or not to trust him the next two books that i got from a Lumi crate if i remember my month order properly are dangerous remedy by cat dunn and the court of miracles by kester grant and i'm showing them to you together because they are both like set in revolutionary france which is interesting to me. They're both written by not French people, so I'm a little bit like trepidatious about whether or not I will like them because I don't have form with liking books that are set in France, particularly historical France, that are not by French people, and that's usually just because it does like tropey or stereotypical things that I don't like, but we will see. Dangerous Remedy says on the front, we cheat death as the blade falls. It has a little guillotine in the front. 
I'm gonna assume this is set in the terror when they were guillotining like everybody and this is not about how like the nice noble people have to escape the revolution because you know murdering people is bad <laughs> but also the nobles they were not cool people but yes it is set in 1794 and it says uh, Paris seizes like a many-headed serpent in the reign of terror so that makes total sense to me and then we are following a group of outcasts including a revolutionary's daughter her runaway lover a deserter and an aristocrat uh, who call themselves the battalion of the dead they choose their family their future and they choose to fight to cheat the guillotine of its bloody harvest even as the blade falls i don't know i don't know how i'm gonna like this this is interesting and then we have of course the court of miracles by kester grant which is a lay mis retelling that i was sent an arc of earlier in the year and I have still not read. I've been talking about this book for months and months and months. I've mentioned this book a bunch of times before. I just wanted to show you the absolutely gorgeous Illumi Crate edition because look at this really, really beautiful foiling. It's also got end pages that I think are not in the regular edition. I'm not actually sure because I don't have one. I've got an arc and I've got this and neither of those are the regular edition of the book. It's got black sprayed edges. Actually, all of my Lumi Crate books have got sprayed edges. So they look really nice uh, together for sure. And as I mentioned, it is a Lamez retelling that focuses on the character of Eponine in this you know, universe, the revolution didn't actually happen, it didn't work, it failed, and so at this point the people of Paris are mourning the failed revolution and Eponine finds herself having to enter the Court of Miracles, this kind of fabled underworld of crime basically, uh, in order to get her sister back from the Guild of Flesh. So that's the premise of the story. And now we're getting into books that I bought and picked myself, starting with a giant batch of comics that I got from my local comic bookstore when they reopened after lockdown. I just wanted to make sure that I was gonna buy a bunch of books from them because they're a local store to me and I want to make sure that they stay in business. First up, I've got Descender Volume 6, The Machine War by Jeff Lemire and Dustin Nguyen. This is one of my favorite comic series. I was gonna say that is going on at the moment, but it's actually finished because this is the final volume. It has this wonderful, wonderful watercolor art style that I absolutely adore. I I'm only up to book five. I haven't actually read six yet, so I wanted to pick it up. And I also wanted to pick up Ascender. Ascender? Ascender? I don't know exactly how to say it, but it is the new series that is like in the same world as Descender, but years and years in the future, I believe. Volume one is called The Haunted Galaxy. If you haven't heard me gush about Descender before, it's a sci-fi series that's set in a world where about 15, 20 years ago, all robots were banned. There used to be robots doing all kinds of jobs, but then one day, completely out of the blue, the robots rise up and start murdering humans, and therefore humans decide, you know what, it's safer to not have any robots anymore, and ban robots and start deactivating them, deassembling them for scrap, and all of that. But at the very beginning of the book, it's been 15, 20 years, and we follow this little companion robot called Tim21 who wakes up and is looking for his family because he came to this mining station as the companion for a little boy with the little boy and his mother, and he's just looking for them and can't find them. And so the whole story is his quest to find his family, if that's at all possible, whilst also, you know, trying to not get deactivated and disassembled for scrap. And then in the second series, A Sender, I think that's how you would say it anyway, it is 10 years later, but I'm not reading any more of the blurb than the phrase, a decade has passed, because I haven't actually read the final volume and I don't want spoilers. <laughs> So I'm very excited about these because, like I said, the art style is absolutely gorgeous, really love the watercolors, and I can't wait to catch up 
and start a new series. I've got a few more uh, comics that I picked up because they were finalists for the Hugo this year. We have Monstrous Volume 4, The Chosen by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. And this is an epic fantasy story with these beautiful silk punk vibe. I mean, you can see just from the cover, it's incredibly intricate and it's also very gory. So I don't know <laughs> if I just flick it through how much blood you're gonna see, because it's always a possibility. <laughs> but it's quite dark. We follow uh, our main character here, Micah Halfwolf, who has a demon living inside of her and she is trying to control it and make sure that it does not control her. We are in a world that is uh, strongly divided between like one side that wants zero magic at all and then another side that, you know, is ancient magical beings and fey and like half animal, half human hybrids and stuff. So it is quite complex. I will probably want to be rereading the first three before I dive into the fourth one because I always do that when a new one comes out. There's also Talking Cats. Who doesn't love a good talking cat? This one I'm very excited for. I've also got the final volume of Paper Girls, volume six. Very intrigued to see how this one finishes because it is a time travel-y, timey-wimey. The first time that I read like the first couple of books, I was fairly confused. But when I bought book five, I reread all of them and it made a lot more sense. So I think I'm gonna, again, <laughs> reread all of them so I can read uh, six. <laughs> Probably not immediately since I didn't have time to do it before the Hugos and I've got quite a bit on my plate for August, but I'm looking forward to it when I get to it. This one is by Brian K. Vaughan, uh, Cliff Chang, Matt Wilson and Jared K. Fletcher. And the colors by Matt Wilson are amazing. Matt Wilson won an Eisner Award for Best Colorist uh, for this series, which like, obviously, <laughs> if you've ever opened one of these books, like even if the story isn't your cup of tea, the colors in these books are amazing. <laughs> And then the final book I picked because it was a graphic story finalist in the Hugos is Die Volume 1 Fantasy Heartbreaker by Kieran Gillen, Stephanie Hans, and Clayton Cowles who did the letters. I was quite curious to see what this one was about because it was one of the books on the shortlist that was like a first book in a new series. Uh, there's also a few standalones in there but you know I already know Monstress and Paper Girls and that I like them and I wasn't going to pick up volume 9 of The Wicked and the Divine when I've not read any of it and I can't unfortunately afford to just out of the blue by nine volumes of a comic book. My library doesn't have it. So that I was kind of stuck about, but die, I was quite interested in checking it out. And it turns out to be a really dark, weird, somewhat meta story about a game of D&D that goes kind of a little bit Jumanji, where these six main characters are playing D&D and they all get sucked into the game. And uh, as you can tell from uh, just the colors inside this book and like the kind of contrast that you get is quite a dark story like it's not fluffy or anything dnd jumanji but actually looking at it really really seriously and looking at how it would mess people up and finally in comics i've got two volumes of the new buffy the vampire slayer comic this is the new series out from boom studios it is written by jordi belair this first volume here high school is hell that's illustrated by dan mora and the second volume once bitten is illustrated by david lopez this isn't a straight up reboot or retelling of the original show it's not a continuation it's just using the characters in the original show and some of their stories but in fully new ways. I don't know if you can see uh, from here on the cover but Buffy's holding a smartphone as well as a stake. It is set in the modern day. Buffy is in high school but she doesn't really know anybody or have any friends at this point. Buffy is working a terrible fast food job and she then runs into Xander and Willow. She saves them from a vampire and then they become friends but you are seeing a Willow and a Xander who are fairly different from the 
original show, Willow's already like figured herself out and come out. She's quite goth. She has a girlfriend. Xander has, I think, a gaming channel or something like that. He streams maybe. And I'm not gonna say too much more because I don't want to spoil the character reveals if you just want to get into this and enjoy kind of like the way that they've done this. Oh, and one more comic that I didn't actually put with the comics originally is uh, Check Please by Ngozi Ukazu. This is book two, Sticks and Scones. This is originally a webcomic and our main character is Eric Bittle, nicknamed Bitty, who is a baker, a vlogger, an ex-figure skater who now plays hockey and he's just moved into a new town for university at the very beginning of the first book. So we follow his four years at Samuel College where he joins the hockey team and realizes that in the Samuel hockey team they do checks which they didn't do at his previous hockey team because it was less competitive I guess and checking is like that thing they do in hockey where they barrel into each other full force to like stop them having the I don't know anything about hockey except what I learned in this comic and I don't know how accurate it is and then it is also about Bitty having a massive crush on Jack the captain of the hockey team whose dad is a very very famous hockey player he was gonna be a hot shot player who was going to be drafted and then like fell off the face of hockey earth because of stuffs that gets revealed in the book and that I don't want to say because spoilers. It's the story of these two lovely lovely humans and the hockey team around them and it's nice and it's happy. Next up we've got The Deep by Rivers Solomon with David Diggs, William Hudson and Jonathan Snipes. This is a novella that is based on the song The Deep by the band Clipping which is why they're credited as co-authors for this and as you can tell by the cover it is a mermaid book. It is based on the idea that the enslaved pregnant women who were thrown overboard of slave ships during the Atlantic slave trade even as they died even as they were murdered they managed to give birth and their children survived and adapted to the water became mermaids and now we are many many years and generations later and this people of mermaids they are still there they are still strong but the way they manage to survive and continue to live is by storing all of the memory of the trauma of their people into one person and this person is the storyteller Yetu. She holds all of the memories of her people and she is really really struggling with those because obviously they're extremely extremely traumatic and this story here is about her struggling with those memories that she is giving back to her people once a year so that they can still be anchored and know where they're coming from but they will forget it in only a few days and she's the only one who remembers it all the time. This is a brilliant book and I'm definitely not the person to do the review for it but I will be talking about it some more when I do my wrap up. Next up we have The Order of the Pure Moon Reflected in Water by Zencho. This is one I've been anticipating for a super long time. This is a Wuxia inspired fantasy so we have this awesome like historical fantasy secondary world uh, setting going on and we start with two bandits walking into a coffee house and picking a fight and they get one of the waitresses fired from her job so she decides to follow them and become a member of their band of bandits whether they want it or not. And it also turns out that this waitress was very recently a devotee of the Order of the Pure Moon reflected in water. I did hear this book described as fanfic for a non-existent Chinese drama. That description was really apt because it has a lot of pining. Let me tell you, pining. 
that's all I'm gonna say, but if you're into pining, pick up this book. Next up, I've got a couple of sequels. The Survival of Molly Southbourne by Tade Thompson. I'm really, really excited for The Murders of Molly Southbourne. I read, I don't know, a couple years ago when it first came out. Really, really enjoyed it. And I meant to pick this up earlier and I haven't yet, so I figured I would remedy that. This is a tiny Tordacom novella and the premise for the first book, The Murders of Molly Southbourne, is that this woman, Molly Southbourne, she has to try her hardest not to bleed because whenever she bleeds, murderous clones of herself pop out of the ground and yes, try to murder her because they're murderous clones. I have no idea what the second book is about because the first book wrapped up to me in a way that felt like it was done, but I am quite intrigued to see where this actually goes. And for something that's a sequel where the previous one didn't at all wrap up like it was finished and done with, we have Imaginary Numbers by Shannon McGuire. This is number nine in the Encrypted series, which I absolutely, absolutely adore. <laughs> this series is all about the Price family who are cryptozoologists. Basically, they do conservation, but instead of doing animal conservation, they do cryptid conservation. So they work with cryptids and creatures that other humans might call monsters. And what they do is they protect the cryptids from the humans who would, you know, hunt them down. But they also make sure that cryptids don't go around snacking on people too much. Imaginary Numbers is the first book that is about Sarah, Sarah Zellaby, who is a character we have seen before, but this is the first book in her point of view. And I'm very, very interested in seeing her point of view. Although there is a thing in there about like how she fancies her cousin. It's been a thing throughout the series and everybody just thinks it's hilarious that both of them are really into each other. Both Sarah and her cousin Artie are really into each other, but they're the only person that doesn't know that the other is really into them. It's like it's her cousin, so I don't know. I don't know how this book is gonna handle that. They're not actually related because technically she's not human, she's a cryptid, but still cousins. Next up, we've got some nonfiction. I picked up a copy of Brit-ish on Race, Identity and Belonging by Afro Hirsch. And this is a book about being a British person of colour and being challenged about, quote, where you're from, even though you're British and all your family is British and you've always lived in the UK and you were born in the UK and you're British. But you get challenged because racism is <laughs> is something that felt important for me to pick up because I'm an immigrant in this country, but because I'm a white immigrant, I never really get challenged like that. People only ask me where I'm from if they hear my voice and my accent, but they don't ask me where I'm from on seeing my face. And that's, you know, something that's been quite obvious to me for a long, long time. In the back of the book, it says, we are a nation in denial about our imperial past and the racism that plagues our present. Brit-ish is a deeply personal and provocative exploration of how this came to be and an urgent call for change. So that seems like some very, very necessary reading because of course, as people have talked about way before and then now in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, racism is a cancer that's everywhere and it is also very much in the UK. You see people reacting to news from the US saying like, oh, we don't really have that in the UK and that's so not true. We do have a lot of racism and also police brutality. So I wanted to make sure to pick something that was you know, a more um, British specific perspective uh, to educate myself. A lot of the nonfiction that I've picked up that was specifically around uh, race and racism and anti-racism was on audiobook because I really like nonfiction audiobook, but I couldn't find an audiobook copy of this at the time. So I ended up getting a physical copy and I should have some more books to talk about in a future haul. Maybe if I have a haul that has fewer books than this ridiculous amount, I can also tell you about some audiobooks that I bought at the same time. It was just too many to just like add on to this huge pile. I've got two more books to tell you about. First up, we have Threading the Labyrinth by my friend Tiffany Ingus. This book has 
an absolutely gorgeous cover. I mean, look at how intricate that is. That's really pretty. There is also a blurb on the front from M.R. Carey, which I'm really, really excited about. It says, a poignant and elegant meditation on time and identity. We follow Tony, the owner of a gallery in the US. The gallery is failing and the business is about to fold when she is suddenly called back to the UK unexpectedly because she's inherited this manor house in Hertfordshire from a mysterious lost relative and so she goes and she is desperately looking for something to save her failing business. She needs something valuable to sell, some painting or antique furniture maybe, but when she gets to the manor house she finds it crumbling and empty, overgrown gardens but she gets obsessed with it, she starts researching it, she immerses herself in it, and um, she finds out weird things. The gardens seem to change in twilight. The ghost of a fighter plane from World War II figures she sees from the corner of her eye. So maybe ghosts? maybe timey wiminess I don't really know, but this sounds very intriguing. And finally, the last book I've got to share with you for this massive, massive book haul is Consolation Songs, an anthology of optimistic speculative fiction for a time of pandemic. This was edited by my friend Iona Dutt Sharma, and it has such a fantastic lineup. We have stories from Alia de Bodard, Stephanie Burgess, Marissa Lingen, Freya Mask, Tansy Rain. Roberts, Adrian Tchaikovsky, and more. In the back here it says a radio broadcast unites a scattered people, lockdown throws human and fey reluctantly together, a miner floats alone in the asteroid belt, a living ship rides out a storm. That all sounds very exciting, especially a living ship. I love a living ship. We know this about me. I read both Robin Hobb and Anne McCaffrey at an impressionable age, so give me all of the living ships always and forever. But continuing with what it says in the back, in difficult times, stories sustain us. These 12 tales of selkies, hockey players, retired system engineers, monsters, copy editors, and changelings are connected by a thread of optimism and hope hope that we too will write out this storm. And all profits for this book will be donated to the COVID-19 appeal run by the UCLH charity. That is the charity that is supporting University College London Hospital NHS Trust. So it goes to a very, very good cause and is also very, very pretty. If you'd like to order a copy, there will be a link to purchase it in the description below. Usually I try to only do like Goodreads links so I can let people choose where they want to purchase purchase things, although I realize Goodreads is an Amazon thing and it's bad, but I will actually leave a purchase link for this because it is for charity. So that's it. These were the over 20 books that I acquired since I last did a book haul. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're still here, congratulations because it's probably super, super long. I've been recording for almost two hours, so thanks for sticking around uh, and I hope you enjoyed this video. I will try not to leave it quite that long before doing my next book haul so that it's not like quite this massive. <laughs> if you'd like to see more from me you can check out a previous video on screen right now and if you haven't yet please hit the subscribe button that's on my face for a new video from me every week. I've been Claire, thanks so much for watching and see you soon.